In this video, we'll take a look at the Timex Sinclair 1000, a low-cost microcomputer from the early 1980s. I'll say something about the history of the computer, go over its hardware and software capabilities, give a demonstration, and take a look at the hardware inside. Sir Clive Sinclair is an English entrepreneur and inventor known for consumer products related to radio, calculators, computers, pocket televisions, and electric cars. His company's first computer product was the ZX80, introduced in 1980 at a price of $200. The ZX81, introduced in 1981, was a slightly improved version offered as a $100 kit or assembled for $150. In this video, we'll look at the version of the ZX81 sold in the U.S. and Canada and branded as the Timex Sinclair 1000, which was identical to the ZX81, except it had 2K rather than 1K of RAM. It was introduced in July 1982 at a price of $99.95. The Sinclair ZX81 was followed by the ZX Spectrum in 1982, which had more memory, a better keyboard, integral tape deck, and color capability. It was followed by the Spectrum Plus, Spectrum 128, Plus 2, Plus 3, and other models, and eventually an IBM PC compatible before the company was acquired by Amstrad in 1986. Under the Timex branding, the company followed the Timex Sinclair 1000 with the Sinclair 1500, 2000, and 2068 models. The Timex Sinclair 1000 is housed in a plastic case about 6.5 by 7 inches by 1.5 inches high with an integral 40 key membrane keyboard. It features a 3.25 MHz Z80 CPU with 2K of RAM and an 8K ROM. It's powered by the included external 9V DC wall wart type power supply. An RCA jack provides video output which is switch selectable for TV channels 2 or 3. It's RF out only, no composite video. Video is 24 lines by 32 columns of text, monochrome, where the bottom two lines are typically used for program editing and error messages. Output supports uppercase characters, numbers, and punctuation, as well as 22 graphic symbols. There's a limited graphics capability where each character position can store four pixels for a resolution of 44 by 64 pixels. There are jacks marked ear and mic for connection to a cassette tape player for program saving and loading. On the back is a 46 pin edge connector which was used for connecting optional accessories including the TS1016 16K RAM expansion module and the TS2040 32 column thermal printer. Built into ROM is a basic interpreter that accepts 34 keywords and 24 functions. It uses an unusual scheme where keywords and functions are entered as single keystrokes. The language interpreter knows by context whether to expect a keyword or letter and used a key to specify when entering a function name. While the basic language of this era was not standardized, this dialect was a little more non-standard than most. The system needs to be connected to a television set, typically using the supplied switch box so you can select between the computer or antenna as the signal source. As I'll explain later, I've modified this system for composite video out and I'm using a monitor rather than television. The 9V DC power supply is connected and if using a cassette tape player, it can be connected using the supplied cable. The power and tape jacks all use the same size connector. The manual says that the system can handle the power being connected to the wrong jacks without damaging it. On power up, the system is ready for you to enter a basic command or line. The K prompt means that it's expecting a basic keyword. Pressing a key will enter the basic keyword listed on the key. Depending on the context, this will change to L to indicate that it's expecting a letter or number. You can also enter a function by typing function and then hit the corresponding key like zero for peak. Here's an example of entering a basic command in immediate mode with no line number.
And now here's an example of entering a simple program. We can list it with the list command, although it's already shown up on the screen. And we can type the R command to run it. Notice the blazing speed. Even for a 3.25 MHz Z80 CPU, this seems pretty slow. One reason is that apparently the basic interpreter was itself written in an interpreted language rather than in assembler. Another is that much of the video generation was done in software by the CPU and takes a significant amount of the processing time. To speed up calculations, the system can run in two modes. By default, it runs in slow mode where the system continuously generates video. In fast mode, the video output is turned off until the system is waiting for user input, allowing it to run up to four times faster. You can switch mode using the slow and fast commands. Cassette tape load and save is one example of where video generation is turned off. During save or load, you see lines on the screen which give some indication of progress, but more as a side effect rather than by design. Here's an example of saving this small three-line program which we just entered. You can specify a file name on save and on load. The BASIC is reasonably full-featured with floating-point math with eight significant digits, a set of math and string manipulation functions. One strange omission is the lack of read, data, and restore statements. If you have a printer, you can send output to it. You can also call machine language code using the user function. Here's a simple example of the 44 by 64 pixel graphics supported by the plot and unplot commands. This program simply plots random pixels on the screen. BASIC is covered quite well in the included 150 plus page manual. Some of the other quirks of this BASIC variant include lack of lowercase characters, no need for parentheses around functions, and no support for multiple statements per line. The screen also only scrolls when a program explicitly executes a scroll command and the user needs to type a continue command to continue when output reaches the bottom of the screen. Looking inside the unit, you can see that all circuitry except the keyboard is contained on one double-sided printed circuit board. It only uses four integrated circuits, the Z80 CPU, an 8K masked ROM, a 2K RAM chip, and the ULA chip. The ULA is a custom chip built by Ferranti, which perform video generation, tape audio in and out, address decoding, and other glue logic functions. The board has different stuffing options to accept one or two RAM chips, and apparently could accept a 4K RAM chip if a larger socket was used. Power went through a 5 volt regulator IC. Note the large heat sink attached to it. The RF modulator is inside this shielded compartment. Different modulators would have been used in different countries, and jumpers on the board select between NTSC, North America, PAL, UK, and CCAM, France, video formats. The only other components on the board are passives, resistors, and capacitors. Here you can see the edge connector for expansion. The keyboard is glued into half of the case and connects by two flex cables. The continuous flexing of the cables as well as the heat from the heat sink caused many units to fail when the metal contacts of the cable break. This was the case on my unit as I'll discuss later. The case has internal conductive paint for shielding. Flexible strips of metal 
on the motherboard contact the top and bottom of the case to ground them. It appears that this was not adequate and another connection was made using a lump of foam covered with aluminum foil. I purchased this unit on eBay in June 2015 from a Canadian seller. The unit was complete with the styrofoam from the original box and came with the power supply, audio cable, TV switch, manual, warranty card and accessories brochure. The seller said he had kept it for the last 16 years but had never turned it on. The manual looks like it had been reasonably well used and the warranty information indicates that it was intended for the Canadian market with an address in Markham, Ontario. A brochure lists available software for the computer, priced from about $15 to $30, and most required the 16K RAM expansion. When powered up, it ran, and I was able to enter basic commands. There does seem to be a problem with repeating characters being shown. I suspect this is caused by the ULA chip starting to fail and has some faults. I also can't successfully save or load programs to tape, which also makes use of the ULA hardware. The ribbon cable also suffered from the common problem of the contacts breaking and I fixed this using the common method of cutting the cable shorter past the point of breakage and then reinstalling it. The computer worked with most analog televisions, especially black and white, at the time it came out, but the video is not fully compliant with the NTSC standard and may not work with some modern digital TVs. One TV I tried it with did not work, it was not able to sync, but my large screen TV did work. I made a modification to tap into the NTSC video signal before the RF modulator and brought it out to an RCA jack via a piece of coax cable. This improved the quality of the images and allows it to be used with a composite monitor as I'm doing here. The unit does run basic programs including all keywords and functions. I also tried some simple Z80 machine language code. The date codes on the integrated circuits are late 1983 and early 1984 as would be expected. The case indicates that it was manufactured in France. There's a lot of information on the internet on this computer including software, hardware information including schematics, books and even a disassembly of the ROM code. There are also a number of simulators that will run on a desktop computer. The main strengths of the computer at the time were its low cost and a pretty complete basic implementation. Its main weaknesses were the keyboard and limited amount of RAM. Only very small programs will fit in the 2K of RAM and many users would have opted for the 16K RAM expander. I remember back in the day seeing pictures of the computer and thinking it looked quite attractive, but seeing one up close I was surprised at how small it was. The computer is historically significant in that it was the first real computer that was offered for under $100. The low price drove competitors such as Commodore to reduce their prices in order to be competitive. While it was awkward to use and program, it gave many people a taste of what computers and computer programming was about and inspired them to continue and make a career of it. I hope you enjoyed this look at a vintage computer. Be sure to check out my other videos on retro computing and vintage electronics.